Joshua to pray for his dad this morning. Joshua, please come up. Yeah, God, I pray for my uh, dad here. I pray, Lord, for the lecture. That would be great. God, I pray, Lord, that whatever um, his space it would be imparted uh, wisdom and knowledge. And God, I pray, Lord, that the Spirit will fall on him to just give a good lecture today. And I pray for just the rest of the day how it will turn out. And I pray, Lord, just, um, uh, just for a good lecture. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right. So the plan for today will be I'll briefly introduce Zephaniah for you and also uh, Habakkuk then we'll go back to Jeremiah you will be doing your skits first then when we begin with Jeremiah and then the remaining of the morning we'll talk a lot about well for one thing we'll talk about the new covenant that's gonna be fun and maybe some other things as well can is my microphone working yeah. okay all right and then uh, Lamentation, and I think it is Nahum that you have to do this week, is that correct as well? So those, just look up some information from Nelson Maps and Charts. It's pretty basic. As far as all the points that you have to do in your homework, you only actually do, just make sure that you see that in your uh, manual, you only actually have to do Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, all six or seven points, uh, you know, for the homework. And then for the smaller books, you only have to do uh, I think it's the first two, context and summary. So just make sure you know, you're aware of that so that you don't, that you not work yourself to death this week by having to do all seven points for all the books that we're covering this week. So that will not be necessary. Yeah? Good. Any questions about yesterday? We made an, inv we, uh, we, uh, I, I said, we just shared, Mark just, just uh, shared that we're going to have a new small group, which is, of course, the outreach team small group. And uh, I would like you to, as I said yesterday, I do want to encourage you to continue to pray about this. Maybe God wants you to join the outreach team, too. And then, uh, like, we'll, we'll give you this week to pray about it still. And then uh, I'm sure that uh, Sarah wouldn't mind to have another person join the small group that is going to be going to go on outreach as well. So uh, just in, in light of what uh, maybe the Lord has been speaking you, to you already yesterday, and uh, if, if you feel that God is calling you, of course it has to be not me, but it has to be God speaking to you. And if that is the case, uh, step out in faith, and let's do it. Amen? Good. Zephaniah, let's do that first. Zephaniah, obviously we don't have a whole lot of time um, in these books. Um, that is why we invite you back to the SBS after DBS, all right? <laughs> then you will have a little bit more time. But even in the SBS, people will discover after nine months of SBS, even then they will say, oh, all we really did is an overview. They discover, again, that there is still a whole lot more. They still discover, you know, before the SBS, people think they knew a lot about the Bible. And then after the SBS, they discover, oh my gosh, there is a whole lot more to be known about the Bible. And uh, so, of course, that's even more so in the DBS. So, uh, by all means, do an SBS, especially if God is calling you to be a preacher or a teacher of God's words, I would recommend do an SBS after your DBS. All right, Zephaniah. The Lord gave this message to Zephaniah when Josiah, son of Ammon, was king of Judah. Zephaniah was the son of Gushi, son of Gedaliah, son of Amariah, son of Hezekiah. And so we see here that he is, um, what do we know? So we know that he is ministering during the time uh, of Josiah's reign. So that is already helpful. Now Josiah reigned, I think it's like 30 some years. So we don't know quite yet when. Uh, uh, but, uh, but that's good. So we also know that he is the son of Hezekiah, a distant son, like four generations down, of Hezekiah, uh, which most people believe it's going to be uh, King Hezekiah. So he has some royal blood in him. He is not an immediate descendant, like he's not to be uh, king. King, He's not uh, that kind of a descendant, but he is... Um, um, a distant relative to, uh, to uh, King Hezekiah. All right, some royal blood is in him. 
all right? Maybe that gave him access to the, th to, to the king, like because he's a relative, he gave him access to the palace as well. All right, so we have other prophets ministering at the same time, which would be, of course, Jeremiah, Hab Habakkuk, also Nahum, and, um, and that is why we talk about these books this week. The, the name means the Lord has hidden. And uh, I mean Yahweh has hidden. And it actually does not come out very well in the, new, in the New Living Translation. So I give you here the ESV because actually the, the idea of being hidden, and I mentioned yesterday, even when the king was trying to kill Jeremiah, the Lord hit Jeremiah and Baruch. And here we see also that uh, the idea of being hidden, this time being hidden from, from God's wrath, is, uh, is uh, being talked about in uh, one of the whole passages in the book of Zephaniah. Yeah? All right. A, a brief historical review. I, I, did, I got this from uh, Carrie. She's also one of our speakers in the last school. Unfortunately, she's not speaking in this school. Carrie asked also from Taiwan. Car uh, Carrie Nive was her last name. Okay, if people don't know. Anyway, awesome teacher. She, she kind of introduced Zephaniah this way, and I like that, so I just borrowed some of that from her uh, to share, just to <coughs> get Get a, get a feel of what's really going on. God created the world, all right? And when God created the world, he also, and everything was going to be perfect and beautiful, and then God placed mankind in the midst of his creation, all right? And he gave him stewardship over everything. Mankind that was going to be created in God's image, was created in God's image. All right. There was only one request that God made from mankind, and that is, do not eat from the, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then Sat Satan comes into the picture and challenges God's character. All right. And so, obviously, you know the story. Adam and Eve sinned, and so they are banned from the Garden of Eden. They are banned from what was paradise, what was perfect and uh, sin has entered into the world. That's what Romans says, Paul says. All right? But God also immediately from the very beginning already gave a promise about that he will redeem men again. And so that promise is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I trust that as you have been tracing God's redemptive plan throughout the Bible, that you also have made a note of that. The very first promise is already given in Genesis chapter 3. All right, and so then with Abraham, God's redemptive plan is set into motion, yeah? And so we read that in Genesis chapter 12. Also very important that you have that part of your tracing of God's redemptive plan. God has chosen Abraham of all the people to work out his purposes of redemption for all of mankind, to undo what man has done, the damage that man has done to this world, all right? A couple generations later, Descendants of Abraham went into Egypt. Seventy people go into Egypt, the Bible says. And then nearly 200, two million people will come out of Egypt uh, uh, 400 some years later, all right? They went into Egypt as free men, but during the time while they were in Egypt, they were beginning to become, uh, they were turning into slaves. The Pharaoh began to enslave the Hebrew people. We don't know exactly for how long, but probably a couple of hundred years that they were slaves. And then God delivered them from, the ex, uh, from Egypt in 1446 BC. This is a conservative date. There are some other people, other scholars that will give you a different date about 200 years later. But we believe it's uh, from um, looking at the text, we, we believe that this is the, probably the more accurate date. All right? Then God made a covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. Yeah, God basically says to Israel, I did something for you. I delivered you out of Egypt. Now enter into a relationship with me and this is what you need to do in return. And that is obey. And so that is why we have the covenants. All right. And God wanted to be king of Israel. And he was for 300 years. But then 300 years later, and when we come to the book of Samuel, and Mark probably mentioned that, Israel wanted a human king and therefore rejected God as their king. All right? And then Israel had three kings under 
the united monarchy, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then the, the monarchy broke into two pieces. And so we now have the northern kingdom that henceforth was going to be called Israel, and we have the southern kingdom that henceforth was going to be called Judah. The larger, the ten tribes went to the north, so the most of the land went to the north, and only basically one tribe, Judah, with one smaller tribe that, that, uh, that joined in, uh, was going to be the southern kingdom, the kingdom that is still with Jerusalem as the capital, where we still have a king, a descendant of David on the throne. Whereas in the northern kingdom, as we already discovered, none of the kings, 19 kings, none of them were good. They were all bad. There you have different dynasties. You have one king killing another king, and I mean, one wanting to be king, killing another king, and so you have a change of dynasty and so forth. Whereas in the south, we always have one dynasty, the dynasty of David, who will continue to be ruling on the throne in Jerusalem, as promised to David, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, but then suddenly they're in for a shock. And that is in 586 BC, suddenly no more king on the throne on Jerusalem. All right, so we have that kind of a basic overview. All right, and so that is what the role of the, and that is what the prophets are going to speak into. All right, in what is going on in Israel. What is the role of the prophets? What did you guys learn from John Renison? What is, what is the prophet supposed to do? I'm sorry? Very good. Foretelling and forthtelling. What do you like to say? Warning of coming judgment from the Lord due to their disobedience. Okay. Warning of coming judgment if they are disobedient. Okay, very good. So, in some ways, they are not really f predicting all that much in the future. Basically, they're just reading the law, and they says, well, in the law it says that if you disobey, this is what's going to happen. So, it is uh, foretelling, much more foretelling than foretelling. Very good. All right. So, they remind the people of the covenant, and if they break the covenant, they will tell them what is going to happen. Okay? The very covenant that the people made with God at Mount Sinai. Right here at Mount Sinai. I, by the way, climbed that mountain. It's awesome. All right? You have to start at the middle of the night, and then you start climbing up, and then by sunrise, you're all the way on the top. I was right there, whoa, where Moses once was. At least believed to us, because we, those scholars are not quite in agreement which mountain actually was Mount Sinai. But I went to the one that the majority of the scholars, the conservative scholars, believe must have been Mount Sinai that, that Moses climbed. All right? So to remind Israel the conditions of the covenant he made with them at Mount Sinai after he delivered them from Egypt and called them to repentance, if repentance is needed. Very good the role of the prophets. All right, good. <clears throat> All right, now Zephaniah, he was one of the last prophets to speak before Judah was going to be gone into exile. As I already said before, he already knew that the exile was going to be, it's, it is going to happen. Exile is destined to happen because Manasseh was such an evil king. But yet he did not cease from trying to pursue the people that he loves, the Israelites, to try to convince them to come back to the covenant. If they do, then there may be some, they may be what we just uh, read yes, uh, just now, that so that you may be hidden from the wrath of God. Okay, you may be protected. You may still go into exile, but maybe your head is not going to be chopped off. All right? And so you, still will may, you may end up still going into exile. But so Zephaniah is ministering to the people, still hoping, there is still grace. They're still hoping that some may be hidden from God's wrath. All right? Now, despite the fact that the people were terrible, all right? terrible, the, the sins that they committed. 
Uh, I'm not just talking about idol worship, but I'm talking about the injustice, the oppression of the poor, the, 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 the way they neglect to take care of the widows, the fact that uh, 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 enslave people, that, that they exploit people, the fact that uh, they burn their children to the false gods, all the things that you thought that only the bad people in a long time ago would do, but a Hebrew person would never do, because nobody, you never been told that in Sunday school when you grow up. But actually they were just as bad. In fact, during the time of uh, Manasseh, uh, God says, you behaved even worse than the Canaanites. All right, and so judgment is due. Exile is going to happen. It is already determined. All right, and yet Zephaniah pursues them. Imagine, okay, if God would call you to be a minister to ISIS, if God would call you to go to Iraq or Syria and to preach the gospel, how would you feel? Would you question, is this really you, God? I, th I would. <laughs> I don't want to go. And maybe it's not just because I fear for my life. It may also be because maybe in my heart I really don't want to save them. Because if I, if I don't want to reach out to them, because I watch the news and I want Obama to send some more planes over and drop some more bombs. All right, that was maybe my sense of justice communicating in me and says, I have to, that is what ha that needs to happen. Everybody agrees, but no, that's not the way we operate in the kingdom of God. That's not what God's heart is. God's heart is for everyone's salvation including the people in ISIS. And if God, Zephaniah was called to, to reach out to a people that were horrible, all right? The fact that the people are horrible should not change our attitude towards them. And maybe God calls us. Jonah was called to go to Nineveh. The very people that deported, the, deported the, people, the, uh, the northern kingdom into exile naked. They were deported. And many, many, many people died. So no wonder Jonah didn't want, to go, didn't want to go. And yet Jonah had to go to a horrible people because God loves them. And we saw that miracle happening that actually the whole city turned to God. All right. Good. So uh, where are we? Now, when we come to the prophets, so we, we think about foretelling, we think about foretelling, predicting, and sometimes we, well, we love prediction, don't we? Why don't we read, why do we like to listen to speakers about the book of Revelation? Well, because we like to know the future. Sometimes we behave so pagan, because it's the pagans that like to do reading the palm, you know, reading the lines in the, in the palm of your ha hand. It is the pagans that like to look in the crystal ball. Sometimes we behave, we treat revelation like a crystal ball. Oh, I want to know something about the future. All right, when you come to Revelation, you will see it's very different. There is so much beauty in the book of Revelation. To begin with, the very first four words is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's five words. That's the very beginning of the book of Revelation. And if you miss that in the book of Revelation, then you really miss the book big time. And so we sometimes get so in th uh, uh, excited about predictions and so forth, so involved, so engrossed in, in trying to figure out predictions. You know what? You may end up missing the point. And many people do. Because it may be come to a shock to you uh, after having been sat under people preaching about uh, the future and so forth, that really there is not a whole lot of prediction in the Bible that is uh, still our future. All right, Gordon Fee, one of our uh, favorite scholars, I would say, especially in SBS, he wrote this book, How to Read the Bible for All Those Words, and he says less than 5% in the Old Testament, less than 5% is about today. We are now in the church age. We are now in the new covenant age. Less than 5%. So, and, and of course, obviously, if it's predicting something about the church, it's already fulfilled. We are the fulfillment. Less than 2% is specifically about Jesus, of all the predictions in the Old Testament. And less than 1% is actually still in our future. So rather than always trying to impose, oh, you remember the Bible is not written to us. It's written to a very different audience, and they, that was a message to them. 
And so naturally, the majority of the pred predictions relate to them, and that happened thousands of years ago, therefore are already fulfilled. But yes, some of the prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, they saw things, something about the Messiah as well, and then saw something about the new Jerusalem that is still to come. And so there is still some that are even in our future, uh, but it's only 1%, all right? Okay, the day of the Lord, that is what uh, Zephaniah talks a lot about, all right? What is the day of the Lord? Any guess? Or oh, now you're afraid to say something because I already said so much about predictions. What, do you, what comes to your mind when I say day of the Lord? Second coming. Huh? Second coming. Okay, second coming, very good. All right, now the problem is, again, people when they equate day of the Lord automatically with the second coming, they are missing a lot of what the Bible is communicating and misunderstanding a lot of the scriptures. Now the day of the Lord could be the second coming, but many times it's not. Just as I said, very few of the predictions are actually about the second coming, which is in our future, the day of the Lord. But yes, sometimes it is. So the day of the Lord, in the, uh, it, when in the mind of the Israelites that were hearing the prophets, is very different than what we think of. And we, of course, as scholars, as students of the Bible, need to understand what it originally meant to the original reader. All right? And so the day of the Lord is, can mean one of many things. Uh, John Renison shared last week about, about the day of the Lord in the book of Joel. And the book of Joel, the day of the Lord is compared with locusts, with a locust plague. All right, in uh, Amos, uh, the day of the Lord is compared with the Lord roaring from Zion. All right, the day of the Lord, it's the day of disaster, he says in Amos chapter 6, verse 3. All right, the day of disaster. All right, there is a day coming. All right, and he's speaking about this day of the Lord. The Lord's voice will roar from Zion, and he is prophesying. 722 BC. It is being fulfilled 722 BC. The day of the Lord for Samaria was 722 BC. Right? It's not the second coming in that particular verse. Sometimes in other verses it may, but not in this particular verse. So we have the day of, I call it the day of the Logust. All right? Swarming locusts locust coming the day of the Lord, which is like a roaring lion. Now in Zephaniah, the day of the Lord is the Lord is preparing a great slaughter, like the day of slaughter. Whereas in Joel, I say the day of the locusts. In Zephaniah, a different motif is used, and that is one of a altar, and there is something being slaughtered on the altar. By the way, in Amos, the picture is a, a roaring lion. All right, a picture of a roaring lion is another motif given to describe a picture to describe the day of the Lord. Here it is a altar and something is laid on the altar. And in, in Zephaniah it goes like this. The audience, the people that are listening to Zephaniah say, great, we are going to participate at the altar. But then they suddenly come to a realization when Zephaniah says, uh uh, you are on the altar. And the Babylonians are the guests. They thought they were the guests. Uh, the Babylonians are coming to guest. You are laid on the altar. And so the day of the Lord was, aim, was aimed at Israel. It was aimed at Jerusalem this time. Whereas here, it was aimed at Samaria. Here it is aimed at Jerusalem. When is their day of the Lord? It's 586 BC. All right, so that was like the day of the Lord and Jerusalem was destroyed. It could also mean other things. So again, sometimes we even as when we study the scriptures, we don't know for sure because there is another day of the Lord, which would be 70 AD for Jerusalem. Because then again, all of Jerusalem and the temple is going to be destroyed the second time. So sometimes some predictions, predictions may actually be further in the future from the, from the perspective, from the point in time that the 
uh, the speaker speaks to an audience. All right. Then we have the day of the Lord, and um, Jeremiah says, a day of vengeance on God's enemies. Now that is uh, uh, pre uh, predictions against nations. So there, are, there is a day of the Lord for Egypt. There is a day of the Lord for Babylon. There is a day of the Lord for, uh, for Assyria. There is a day of the Lord for Ammon, for Moab. He is going to Tyre, Sidon. He is going through lists of nations that, and the prophets are preaching against them and say the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. You will be judged. This city will be destroyed. Yeah? So the day of the Lord it means many things. Can mean many things. Sometimes it's about the second coming. Most of the time it's not. It is just a day of disaster. Now, the Israelites in Amos, we, we can see, we already read that last week, they thought that the day of the Lord was going to be wonderful. They thought it was going to be wonderful because they were going to be saved. Because they thought the day of the Lord is the Exodus. God will take Israel out of Egypt. God will judge Egypt and God will deliver Israel. But then God says to uh, Amos, uh -uh, don't think it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a bad day because the judgment is now on you. You know, every day of the Lord, you know, judgment on one is one side of the coins. Uh, vindication might be on the other because obviously if, if Jerusalem falls at the hands of Babylon, then it's good news for Babylon. It's bad news for Jerusalem. So there is always two sides to a coin. One is vindicated. One is going to be judged. All right. And so Amos says, uh -uh, don't think it's a good day for you. It's not going to be like the Exodus. It's a bad day. All right. A day of reckoning, and Isaiah says. All right. Again, describing the day of the Lord it will be a day of reckoning where the people will be hold, respon uh, hold, hold responsible for their sins. All right. So we have Assyria, 612 BC. Okay, Nineveh is destroyed. When Isaiah is prophesying, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. This will be the day of the Lord. Then this will be dead. And so you have dates, many dates. I think it is Nahum, uh, not uh, Nahum, Asher, another city in uh, Assyria. That w they have their day of the Lord two, two years earlier. And so that is why you have a timeline and you see some a certain Damascus. Damascus falls 732 BC. So those are all cities that are having their own day of judgment, a day of the Lord coming upon them. All right? So that is what the day of the Lord means. All right? So when you have an outline of the book, the day of the Lord, sometimes we talk about local judgment on Judah. So local 722 or 586 or maybe 605 or 581. All those dates we already have gone through. The different uh, judgments that came upon Jerusalem. But then sometimes and you see the interchange. And then sometimes there is a judgment on the whole world. So that is maybe still in our future. And then there is a, a, a little promise of hope. That is the one, okay... Uh, if you repent, maybe you will be hidden from God's wrath over here. A little bit of a restoration. And then again, we have again local judgment, but now this, this time it's not just Jerusalem. Local judgment on nations. So all those already have come to pass. Many times the day of the Lord is being given for Assyria, for Egypt, for and so forth, Babylon and so forth. And then again, we see this interchange. There is again some judgment on the world, which again makes us think of the second coming. All right? And again, there is a restoration passage as we see many of the, our prophets. How is it structured? How is, the, how is the big picture structured? How is the prophetic book structured? Big picture? One and then the other? Huh? Okay, what's the big picture? Every, every, almost every prophetic book has judgment and then restoration. Yeah, judgment and restoration. That is in every book, almost every book, the case. Except, of course, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is, is a, that big picture is invisible. You can't see it. You have to study it so much in detail to figure out the big picture of Jeremiah. But most of the books are like that. All right, so here we see restoration at the end, a big we have a mini one, but the main thing, the main portion of restoration, judgment and to restoration is also the big picture 
in the book of Zephaniah. All right. So how? As I'm sorry for going so fast because we have to go to the next book already. All right. But how do we apply this? This this message about the day of the Lord. All right. Application. All right. When I study, when I read the book of uh, Zephaniah, when you were discussing the book in your small groups yesterday, you guys did, right? You guys already did Zephaniah? Okay. And, and so what are some of the things that you can apply? Remember, we don't want to just get information. How can we apply it in our lives? Now, so God's judgment is real. How does that affect me? Do you live in that reality? All right. Does it, the, we are no longer going to preach fire and brimstone on people. Why? Because it no longer works. Maybe John Wesley did that, or some of the old prophets did that, uh, minister, uh, uh, evangelists did that a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago. But if you now go and stand, uh, stand in the streets and say, fire will come from hell and you will be, you know, it doesn't work. Fire and brimstone preaching doesn't help. Okay? So we can't really use these books like Zephaniah and warn the people and say, you know, fire is going to come down. All right, so how to read the book of Zephaniah and all the other prophetic books? Well, actually, those prophetic books are more for us than for them. All right, they are more, more for you to read than for the people that are not safe to read. All right, so how do I read this book? Well, if I know that the day of the Lord is real and I got many examples already in, our, in my Bible when the day of the Lord really meant judgment and it was not going to be, it's not pleasant and I know that there is still a second coming of Jesus there will be a the day of the Lord where really God will judge the whole world at once well what does that mean to me if that is true do I live in that reality do I behave every day in accordance to that reality all right it's not so much that we are all oh, we need to figure out when Jesus is going to come back and give it a date that and read that in the crystal ball that is all baloney that is not why it's there for us it is there for us so that we're going to live the future in the present. We are behaving like kingdom of God, like kingdom citizens. But the way God wants us to behave in the future, we are already doing that in the present. We are to be eschatological Christians. Eschatology means the study of the end times. So we are to be eschatol eschatological Christians. We live as if we are, as we live the future already in the present in our attitudes, in the way we care, but also the way we reach out to the lost. We also know that it is not going to be good for them if they are not believing in Jesus. Therefore, we want to tell them about Jesus. Do we live in that re re reality? Do we have the same urgency that Zephaniah had to preach? Okay, to preach. Do we, live, do we have that same urgency? Even though Disaster is going to happen, Zephaniah was still reaching out, even though we know disaster is going to happen, we are still reaching out. Imagine if the volcano burst and lava is flowing towards Kailua Kona. And so Steve thought security is rallying up all the troops here. Everybody on this Waiwan base needs to get in their cars and we are leaving because lava is coming to the campus. All right, picture that for a moment. All right, disaster is coming, like the day of the Lord. But Steve, Steve has arranged for us to go on a ferry, and he says there is already a place prepared for us nearby, say Maui. And so let's go to Maui, and a, a whole village is built for us, for because people were because the government knew what was going to happen someday and so a whole village is already prepared and we are able to go in there and just settle in there and live in a beautiful new home all right picture that great right but what would it be like if there was plenty of room in that place in Maui for everybody in Kona to go and live there 
but we don't tell them. What if it, imagine what if, if we had room in our cars to take them to the ferry, there is room on the ferry for everybody in Kona to go to Maui, but we don't tell them, we don't bother. That would be, that would be horrible, wouldn't it? So, do we live with that same urgency of Zephaniah? Do we see, do we live in that reality that one day the world is going to be judged and therefore we now do need to go and preach the good news? Yeah? All right. Any other comments? What did you guys get from in your small groups about the book of Zephaniah? You guys, I see some of you guys are still waking up. You guys are not used to having teaching from eight to nine, huh? <laughs> Sorry. I know I'm mean to you guys. But you know, tomorrow we don't have any lecture. Well, except of course, Andy Bird from eight to nine, and we know that's gonna be good. So, so that's why we make you pay for it, that you don't have lecture tomorrow. All right. Habakkuk. Did you guys like Habakkuk when you were reading it? All right. Why do you like Why do you like Habakkuk? All right. Um, I will send you the PowerPoint. Right. Uh, the, the internet has been down, so I haven't been able to send it yet. But I will do that when I have a chance. Now we go to Habakkuk. Okay. <coughs> slideshow from the current. Okay. Oh, it is already there. You see that? It is already in your Dropbox. Because I got it back. No, that cannot be because he didn't do it. I haven't sent it to you yet. Yeah. All right. Habakkuk. Why is that? Uh, why did you like Habakkuk? Tell me. How is it different from the other prophets? Because it's like a dialogue between Habakkuk Very good. And God. To God. You see, that is why Habakkuk is different. Okay. Most of the prophets, they speak to the people on behalf of God. But this prophet speaks to God on behalf of the people. And so we see a very interesting dialogue. Like with Jeremiah, all right, it's like Jeremiah is praying and God responds. Here we see Habakkuk is praying and God responds. All right. All right, so what, we do, what do we read? First verse. This is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. And another translation says this is the oracle. So I like it a little bit, little bit better. This is the oracle that the prophet Habakkuk received in a vision. So it means he... Uh, uh, so what do we already learn from this one verse? All right, that he is being called the prophet, which is unusual. Because most of the time people are called into the prophecy later into the story and, uh, and they don't, you know, like Amos, he was just a, uh, he came from the south and I think he was like a, a farmer or something like that. And then God called him to become a prophet. But here we see the prophet as if it is a profession. And we do know that there are prophets operating at the temple. All right, and so maybe he was a temple prophet. We don't know for sure. Some of it is speculation, but we are just curious the fact that it says the prophet. And then it is a message that he saw in a vision. So he sees visions of God, and so what we are reading are visions that he has. He sees this, this dialogue must have been going on in a vision while he is praying to God. So he must, have, he must be having an awesome, awesome time. Now, Habakkuk has been a bit of a, a complainer, has he, is he not? He's lamenting, all right? <coughs> Let me share you a personal story first. Uh, in, uh, in 1991, we uh, had our second DTS, and uh, starting the first DTS was tough, all right? We, uh, we worked really hard. In fact, we canceled the first school, that was in 89, because we couldn't get enough students. And then in 1990, we finally, and I went, I went to all over Australia and New Zealand, speaking in many, many places, both YWAM bases, Bible schools, uh, small home groups in front of belonging to churches and churches themselves. I went to over a hundred places in three months, all over Australia and New Zealand, telling them about missions for the very purpose to get people to come and do a DTS in Taiwan. I had zero people come. 
all right but God still graciously moved and we had we had 11 students in 1990 so finally we had we were able to pioneer we got the first DTS going and then we doubled in size 20 students in 1991 so we were excited we also saw more Taiwanese coming into the DTS's already and so we had a most wonderful DTS and then at the end at the very last day of the DTS we had a break we were at the beach in Taiwan and one of my students drowned and she coming from a Buddhist background uh, we had to deal with the parents um, the parents that don't understand Christianity don't understand what we are doing and we are also a bunch of foreigners anyway and so this became a long miserable time for us uh, it took us more than six months before we actually got to bury my student her name is Dawn and uh, the parents were asking for money which was strange to me now I understand the culture a little bit better we call that comfort money and uh, sometimes in the West we also have arrangements like that when somebody <coughs> loses a life and you're responsible and, uh, and but they were asking for like a million dollars and of course we didn't have that kind of money and we were still new to the culture I was still not fluent in Chinese and and, and, and uh, we don't quite understand the culture. We are still, up till that moment, we are still a bunch of foreigners. For many years, we, had not, we didn't see one Taiwanese join the mission. For many years, no Taiwanese joining the mission. So it was tough. It was really tough. We, 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 we didn't understand the culture. We didn't know how to deal with this. And it took a long time. And so we really were at a time of, we were really depressed we were really downcast my wife she's not here at the moment I remember her crying every day for two weeks straight all right we were like like Habakkuk we were lamenting we were we were lamenting for the loss of dawn but we were also at the same time of course frustrated with the fact that nobody understood us nobody understands why we are here in Taiwan that we cannot be held responsible for what happened and we definitely don't have any money all right and so it took us many 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 more months all right and then finally six months to eight months later I had a, I had a wonderful church totally Chinese church who I where, where Lisha and I always go to worship I was the only foreigner basically together with Lisha we were the only foreigners in that church and then they really came around and, and helped us and they came they raised up raised some money not a million but they raised some money from different churches and we even had YWAM bases like Singapore and so forth that gave us money too that we can give to the parents and so after six to eight months we were able to give them some money and we were able to properly bury uh, Dawn all right and so that was uh, just an extended trial for us not only that happened we were then leading a DTS in the fall because that was in the spring and in that one we were running a DTS in a Bible school in Taiwan and that was probably the, the worst DTS we ever had that we had in a Bible school and we had like 40 people getting ready to become pastors and they were they we, we had problem of people were demonic possessed we had people that were committing about to try to commit suicide we have people that were uh, one would beat up their his wife and we were ministering here and there I remember like casting out a demon here and then I was told oh this guy is trying to commit suicide from the on the six floors up on top of the building so I had to go and run upstairs try to rescue this guy from being so it was just a horrible year all the way around and Don was still not buried at that time so we were ready to pack our bags and go home all right go home and that is kind of what do we do well we complain to God all right it's okay you can complain but complain to God there will there will a follow-up to this I'll share at the end all right to the same story all right all right where am I um, I just dropped my pen here so the outline let me see I think we're gonna do outline now so the outline is that Habakkuk is lamenting or he is complaining and then God gives a response so God answers and so we have a short complaint and a short answer 
Then we have a longer complaint and a, a longer answer from God. And then really chapter 3 is kind of a standalone. It looks actually like a psalm. Uh, when you look at the beginning and the end, it's like a typical psalm. It's also a prayer, all right? And it's, it's, a, it's a prayer of Habakkuk, all right? It's kind of like standing alone. But probably, probably the oracle was this. Oracle, the message was this and this. And then it's like an, an add-on, a prayer that was added on afterwards. All right? So where do we read? What is he complaining about? All right. How long, O oh Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice become perverted. All right. Now at first, knowing, the prophet knowing that 586 is just around the corner, knowing the Babylonians are coming, that's what everybody is already saying, Jeremiah is saying that, uh, Zephaniah is saying, knowing that you were thinking maybe we are surrounded by people who love to argue and fight, maybe he's talking about the Babylonians, but he's not. He's talking about a problem in the city of Jerusalem where there is no justice. He talks about the law has become paralyzed. Well, that has nothing to do with Babylonians. It has everything to do with the covenant, the law that God made with Israel. Israel and the law has grown cold. This word paralyzed is also like has become cold. It no longer is in effect. It's no longer anymore being used. He is complaining about the, the, the Jews in Jerusalem. All right, that is what he is complaining about. Are you not, don't you care? Why, why are you not coming and do something about it? The rich are oppressing the poor. The king is abusing, exploiting, uh, 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 leveling high taxes from the people. And the, 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 the judges are corrupt. And so the law has become paralyzed. The justice is perverted in the courts, it says in the, or oh, here it says, justice has become perverted. So he is talking about an internal problem, not yet an external problem. All right, so Habakkuk is complaining. All right, and so, <clears throat> we may say, boy, Habakkuk, what a complainer. Did mom not ever tell you stop complaining? He behaves like a child. He is just complaining. What was the problem of the Israelites in the wilderness? What did they do? Complaining. complaining. And that made God angry. Alright, because they, God gave them manna from heaven. And then they complain. And God says, what's up with that? I gave them this food. Every time when we complain, even when we complain about the food in this campus, God gets, takes it very personal because God says, I am the one who provided that. That's why we pray right before we eat the food, thanking God for providing us the food. And then we complain about it, about God's provision. So think about that the next time when you complain about the food in the camera and say, you know, maybe I shouldn't be doing that because God takes this very personal. He did it with Israel in the wilderness. He may do that with you too, so don't do that, all right? But, so is always, is, is complaining ever justified? Now, when you complain, ask yourself the following two questions. Number one, about what are you complaining? Yeah, I may be complaining about uh, the campus food. I may be complaining about the traffic. Uh, oh, I, I can't get home fast enough. We have traffic jams. So we don't really have that much in Kona, but say you're living in Los Angeles, all right? Oh, my gosh, we spend an hour in traffic and we complain, we complain, we complain, we complain about petty things, don't we? Yeah. We're really sick, aren't we? We complain about those things. We shouldn't. That is not what 
allows, gives room for us to complain. Second question we should be asking is, to whom am I complaining? All right? When we complain, and especially our petty complaint, we complain with one another, to one another. And that becomes an issue. And so then it becomes a sin. But we can always go to God with our complaints. Okay, we can always bring it to God. And you know what? If we do, if we do that, Jeremiah did a lot of that. Many of his prayers were lamentations. And we express ourselves to God. You know what? Maybe that will help us not to blow up before people. Because we already spend our energy, our frustration. We did that in prayer. We complained to God. We, you know. And you know what? That, that is wonderful. You know, that is wonderful. All right? Moses went to God. Okay, Moses went to God. Why have you given these people? Jeremiah goes to God. Why did you even allow me to be born? The psalmist goes to God. Why do you let the wicked get away with this? Job, Job goes to God. Why have you taken away all my wealth, my sons and my health? I think I paraphrased this a little bit. <laughs> Jesus goes to God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting actually Psalm 122, so even David said that too. Why have you forsaken me? That's fine. That is sacred. That is holy. Complaining about the injustice taking place in Kona, when we bring that to God, we, we call that intercession. Don't we? That is what we can do. And that is wonderful. But not the complaining we do to people. There is a big distinction right there. What we do when we pray to God, again, if you don't have time to write it all down, the PowerPoint comes to you, because I have to go back a little bit. What we are to do when we com bring our complaints to God is that when we, when we do that, we come to this passage of Paul, said, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God all your complaints. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all that He already has done because that way you have faith that He will come, come through again. Then you will experience God's peace. Then you don't blow up in front of people. Okay? The kind of peace that will exceed anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So there is a principle. Bring your complaints to God. Explode before Him. And then people say, man, how come you're so calm? I mean, when I think of Lauren Cunningham and the, the pressure that is always on his life, he has to believe God for millions of dollars. How the heck is he so calm? How can he sleep at night? I can, I can worry, be worried about a hundred bucks and not sleep at night. He is believing the Lord for millions of dollars. I think because he has discovered that key to always bring everything to God and leave it with God and... and Intercession is like, uh, like, like uh, spending your energy, spending your frustrations, bringing your complaints to God. And then once that is gone, you know, it's like an outlet, then you don't blow up anymore before people. So, so after Habakkuk was complaining all this, God's first answer and I'm just, now we, again, because we don't have much more time to, to study this, how, why is it that uh, prophetic books are so difficult to read? It is because there is a lot of poetry. And there is a lot of figure of speech, which is, what is figure of speech? It's speech with pictures, figures. And it really becomes a little bit hard for us to follow. And uh, we are not accustomed anymore to this. So that is sometimes why before, you would start reading the Bible and you would give up sometime later in uh, Isaiah. You are completely lost and don't know what's going on and you give up. Well, part of that is because we just have to really get accustomed to the language. To, and I'll give you some illustrations here. Number one, of course, it says, okay, God is going to do something with the injustice that is taking place in Jerusalem. When the, when the judges are corrupt, Justice is perverted, and God says, you know what, I'm going to do something about it. I'm sending the Babylonians. Ooh, ah. Habakkuk then suddenly realized, ooh, maybe I got a little bit more than I asked for. Okay? It's kind of like, like uh, 
God teach me patience <laughs> and then God will send you a horrible boss and to be patient with and then you said oh my gosh I, I, I maybe I should be more careful asking God to give me more patience because God really is coming through and helps you and gives you a horrible boss and here he goes he sends the horrible Babylonians all right all right so God is says I am going to do something up I'm going to use the Babylonians as a tool to judge Jerusalem remember day of the Lord it is good news for the Babylonians at this moment but bad news for Jerusalem all right then it says for example and he's now there is a long there is a description of what the Babylonians are like all right and so that is a lot of figure of speech and I only give you a few lines uh, I can't go and go through it in detail but it says their horses are swifter than cheetahs in the ESV it says leopards meaning very fast they run very fast now he is describing not just horses he is describing a military machine and so this figure of speech and they go forward they uh, like they press forward they're very eager to capture people yeah they they sweeping captives ahead ahead of them like the sand and uh, there is a lot of sand so it's like there are a lot of captives it's a description you know like when when God says to Abraham many descendants like the sand and like like the stars in heaven it is the idea of multi, uh, multitude so a multitude they will take in captivity all right so it's again figure of speech and the, the Babylonians they will scoff at kings they will scorn at their fortresses all right they simply pile ramps of earth so they they just think man these fortresses are so easy to defeat those walls they just crumble before us because we are so strong we are so mighty so they scoff at the kings in those cities so again you see there's a lot of figure of speech a lot of poetic expressions they pile ramps of earth that means that is how they build ramps to conquer the city they build these ramps of dirt and they put it against the wall so that they can jump over it and so that's what they do all right and so uh, also what I forgot to mention this one it's also like you see often that Babylon is compared with fishermen catching fish okay and that reminds us again of how they deport people in fish hooks so they treat the people like fish and they pull them in dragnets and they put them in their nets and then they drag them all the way to Babylon that is what Habakkuk is saying yeah also he's using the analogy of a fisherman but really he's talking about the Babylonian might yeah they are just like fishermen catching fish so again a lot of figure of speech that is not always easy to follow uh, when you read it for the first time all right Habakkuk's response I'm gonna give you a break soon I'm almost done I just talk fast so that I can give you a break fast all right and also because I want to see the skits that you're about to do all right yes. getting ready all right wow. okay second response all right so uh, wait a minute God are you going to use these unrighteous people to judge us they are worse than us certainly we are more righteous how can you use them so he is saying God uh, 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 give an account of yourself how can you use those people that are worse than us to judge us well God can do what he wants it does not justify God is not justifying what the Babylonians do just as God is maybe not justifying your horrible boss but God uses the horrible boss God is using the Babylonians perhaps to teach us something and so we sometimes say God it's not fair but you know what actually these are lessons that God sends us because God is forming us God is changing us so maybe God is using a horrible boss really to teach us patience as God is also using the Babylonians to discipline the nation of Israel all right uh, oh here we have that idea we are only but fish to be caught and killed I explained that already must we be strung up on their hook so again he's that picture of fish hooks on their mouths being pulled away all right must we be strung up on their hooks I will take my stand up my watch post so so Habakkuk is walk after he says his second complaint he walks towards the wall and goes into a watchtower and he is w w looking outside and says okay God 
what are you going to do about my, my complaint now? So he is calling God to account. He is not, he is complaining with God. Yeah? We can complain with God. That is what Habakkuk is now doing. Now wait a minute, God. That's not what I was asked for.